Well, good evening, and I'm sure it depends on from where you're zooming in. Uh, more than that, it turns out that 5.15 is an odd hour of the day, so I had to look it up in, on the internet. <clears throat> so there are two schools of thoughts here. There are those who say you could say good afternoon until 5 o'clock, and there are those who says it's okay to say good afternoon until 5.59 p.m. and 59 <laughs> seconds. So there you go. For those who don't know me, I am Uriah Kim, president of the GTU. I would like to welcome everyone to the 28th annual reading of the sacred text. For the best experience of this virtual event, Please select the speaker view in the view options. Your mic is muted and will remain so. The chat feature is open and all comments and questions in the chat will be saved. A closed captions option will appear at the bottom of your screen and you can click it and choose to hide the subtitles or make them bigger if they are too small. Normally, when we have this event in person, we provide lots of drinks and snacks. But for the virtual format, it's up to individual attendees to get their own pint of ale and whatever munchies they like. A little background about the lecture series in case this is your first time joining us. John Perriman Brown's presentation for the Friends of the GTU's Flora Lamson Hewitt, Hewlett Library in 1993, titled, What Makes a Text Sacred? Gave rise to a series of explorations of sacred texts. Each year since then, the GTU has invited a speaker with a particular connection to a sacred text written or oral, traditional or new, within a canon of scriptures who are drawn from outside a religious tradition to present the sacred text lecture. I would like to acknowledge those who are responsible for tonight's event. Nancy Solari, chair of the committee for the reading of the sacred text and very good friend of the GTU library. Thank you. Clay Edward Dixon, Director of Library Services. Carol Wolf, Assistant to the Library Director. And David Stiver, Special Collections Librarian. Thank you also to Vivian Wells for her technical assistance and Emily Morrow and the GTU communication team for their help with publicity, including Mark Govera and Barb Cozy. The program tonight will include the world premiere of an, uh, of an arrangement of the ancient melody by musician and GTU student, Stefan Walliger, with vocalist, Paul, Kircher and Mary Beth Lamb. We are very grateful for their participation. Now I am pleased to welcome Dr. Arthur Holder, who will say a few words and introduce this year's speaker, as well as act as moderator of Q&A following the lecture. Arthur really needs no introduction, but I will give it anyway. He is a historian of Christian spirituality, was a professor and academic dean at the Church Divinity School of the Pacific before ser serving for 14 years, which is a record for the DTU, as dean and vice president for academic affairs for the Graduate Theological Union, and continues to serve the DTU as professor of Christian spirituality and has other responsibilities. He gave the annual reading of the sacred text lecture in 2013 and received the GTU Excellence in Teaching Award 
in 2019. Arthur, thank you. Thank you, President Kim. Uh, when I look back at the 14 years I spent as Dean of the GTU, one of the things I'm most happy about is the collection of wonderful scholars we added to the faculty during that time. And as it happens, the last faculty search that I co-chaired was the one that brought tonight's speaker to us. So I'm especially gratified to have the honor of introducing her and which also gives me an opportunity to say, see, I told you she was going to be really terrific. And it turned out just that way. Dr. Catherine Baruch is the Thomas E. Bertelson Jr. Associate Professor of Art History and Religion at the GTU and the Jesuit School of Theology of Santa Clara University. She received her BA from Sarah Lawrence College and her doctorate in the history of art from the University of Oxford. Before she came to, the Ber to Berkeley in 2014, she held positions at the National Gallery of Art in Washington, D.C., and at the Yale Center for British Art. Currently, she's an advisor to the British Pilgrimage Trust and a member of the advisory network for the Yale Center for Material and Visual Cultures of Religion. Her first book, Art and the Sacred Journey in Britain, 1790 to 1850, was published by Routledge in 2015. A second book is coming out later this year from Bloomsbury Press, and it's entitled Imaging Pilgrimage, Art as Embodied Experience, which as you will see is very much related to the topic of this evening's lecture. When classes were able to meet in person, you could usually find Dr. Baruch gathered with her students around some ancient manuscript in the library or standing before a sculpture in the Doug Adams Gallery or on a field trip to a museum or a church somewhere in the Bay Area. Her highly popular courses have addressed topics such as art and pilgrimage, Marian art, Christianity in 50 objects, Tolkien and the visual arts, and composing sacred spaces. Now, refusing to be stymied by a global pandemic, this year she has created new courses on virtual sacred spaces and on engaging the extra textual, a course which is especially helpful for doctoral students who want to use museum archives and digital images in their dissertations. Having co-taught a course with Dr. Baruch myself some years ago, I know how much energy and enthusiasm she brings to the classroom and how dedicated she is to supporting students in their research and writing. She's also very much in demand as a speaker for general audiences, including a star turn last year in her video on labyrinths as pilgrimage in place, which was part of the GTU series on spiritual care and ethical leadership for our times. That's still available on the GTU website and on YouTube. We're in for a treat this evening as we welcome Dr. Catherine Baruch to this distinguished series of the reading of the sacred texts. Her lecture is titled, Shield, Help, and Bring to Joy, Pilgrimage Through Sacred Song. And now it's my pleasure to turn the virtual floor over to Dr. Baruch. Thank you, Dr. Holder. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen for everyone. Um, let's see if we can get this to work. Everyone can, can everyone see my screen? All set, great. Well, I just wanna thank um, Dr. Holder and President Kim for the very kind and generous introductions and to all the people who made the lecture a possibility. I wanna echo Dr. Kim's thanks for the library staff who have put so much work into the program and the behind the scenes staff and student workers. I'm also really grateful to the George Greenia Fellowship, which made the initial research for this project possible. George Greenia himself is uh, here. Hi, George. And I also wanna welcome musicians Stefan Walliger, Mary Beth Lamb, and Paul Kircher. You will have an opportunity to hear their brand new arrangement of Godric's very old song at the end of the presentation today. The other day, I paused in my preparations for this lecture to run an errand. National Public Radio came on the car and I tuned in just in time to hear their new program called Songs of Remembrance. 
We just hit a very grim milestone in this time of COVID-19. 500,000 people have died and that's in the US alone. The program is a chance for people to tell stories of their loved ones through the powerful medium of songs that they loved. I was struck by how each song was so evocative of the person, but also the places where the song was sung by the person. I listened to the story of Adios Lepido, a favorite song of Janet Gonzalez. In this case, the song led the narrator into a discussion of the kitchen, Janet's delicious Puerto Rican food, the energy of love and compassion that exuded from her. Songs are tied to place. They bring comfort and healing. Although I am about to plunge us into the distant past, it is important to note that the critical frameworks I'm about to use can actually be applied to a number of situations where music transports the listener and invokes a sense of joy. This evening, we will explore the healing, protective, and mnemonic capacity of music as used in the context of religious pilgrimage. Our first port of call is the story of Godric, the hermit saint of Finkel. Godric was born around 1065, although the exact date is unknown. According to the hagiographies, he was a merchant seaman, possibly a pirate, much to the delight of my son, Jack, who's really into pirates right now. And he accrued great wealth before giving everything away to take on the life of a pilgrim, traveling to a number of holy places, including Jerusalem and Santiago de Compostela. He eventually settled in Finkel, England, where he led the ascetic life of a hermit. He loved nature and is said to have protected deer, and he was also famous for his salmon pond, which was always teeming with fish. This is um, actually was just supplied to me by the good people of Godric's, St. Godric's uh, Church in Durham, England, and it's, um, it's a drawing of Godric created by a police identikit artist called Bruce Byrne based on Reginald's medieval life of Godric. Another compelling thing about Godric is his connection to St. Thomas Becket, the 12th century Archbishop of Canterbury. Becket was a close friend of Henry II, but they had a bitter quarrel over the power of the church versus crown with Becket defending the church. On the 29th of December of 1170, Becket was brutally murdered with a sword to the skull by knights who were close, closely tied to the king. Godric corresponded with Becket from the safety of his hermitage via a messenger from Westminster who first appeared around the time Becket was elected as Archbishop of Canterbury. Godric told the visitor that he had seen Becket in his dreams and would be able to recognize him in a crowd begging for a blessing and expressing a wish to send him secret messages. Becket asked for Godric's prayers in return. Now, along with his dream visions of Becket, Godric had another visitation. This one was from the Virgin Mary and Mary Magdalene. The two women gave Godric a song. Here's a passage from the life of Godric. The blessed mother of God, Mary, with blessed Mary Magdalene, appeared visibly to Godric and taught him that song with its own melody and advising him whenever he should be tired by sorrows or should fear that temptation or weariness would overcome him, he should remember to soothe and console himself with the sweetness of the song. Henceforth, she said, when you invoke me with this little prayer, you will immediately obtain your gracious helper. I'm just having some trouble advancing the slide. There we go. Through the course of his life, Godric was given three songs during his visions, including the St. Marie hymn, which is our focus tonight. It is important to note that they are the earliest songs in English vernacular to survive along with notation. Can you see the manuscript page there? It froze up for one second there, great. The Virgin Mary is often invoked for her maternal protection and the lyrics of the hymn reinforce this. Holy Mary Virgin, mother of Jesus Christ the Nazarene, receive, shield, help your Godric. Holy Mary, Christ bower, bring me to joy with God himself. As Margaret Coombe has pointed out, at every stage in Godric's Vita, where he is truly in contact with God, the Virgin, etc., music or song are present, and we are invited to conclude that it was through music alone that Godric communicated with God. Now, I want to turn to the revival of Godric's hymn by an organization called the British Pilgrimage Trust, hereafter the BPT, and its role, the song's role, as a relic and as a pilgrimage souvenir. The BPT seeks to activate sacred spaces and evoke cultural memory through the senses. 
Co-founded by Gay, Guy Hayward and Will Parsons in 2014, the BPT is a charitable organization founded in order to advance British pilgrimage as a form of cultural heritage that promotes holistic well-being for the public benefit with a number of itineraries available. It's ecumenical and completely inter-religious, inter predicated on the belief that everyone can make pilgrimage among Britain's spiritual landscape, promoting open accessibility to pilgrimage in Britain and to holy places found upon the path. Thanks to the efforts of the BPT, Godric's hymn, Saint Marie Virgin, has been sung in many places associated with the saint and has become an integral part of the pilgrimage experience. Godric is associated with several sites around England. Finkel Priory, Durham, is where he lived his life as a hermit. He is also thought to have passed through Canterbury on his journey from England to Santiago de Compostela in northern Spain. The route is now known as the Camino Anglais. Here's a brief video of Will and Guy singing Godric's Marian hymn at associated sites. Santa Maria, Virgen, Mother Jesus Christ, Nazareth, on shield of in God rich, on Bring each with that in God as rich and everyone was able to uh, hear that. Um, two of the pilgrimage places where the song has been sung is at the site of Beckett's martyrdom and in the Lady Chapel dedicated to the Virgin Mary at Canterbury, which you didn't see in that video. But Hayward, who has a background in voice and a PhD in musicology, said of his experience singing there, Canterbury has a very strong resonance for that song. There's something about singing a song about Mary or maybe from Mary that is directly contemporary with the age of the chapel itself. It's as close as you can get to that age. The feeling of Mary is really strong in the Lady Chapel, more so than most Mary spaces. It is the inner heart of Canterbury Cathedral, a heart space, not a head space. Hayward described the feeling of the song in the Our Lady of Canterbury Undercroft Chapel as going into the heart and downward Whereas the site of the, at the martyrdom, at the site of Beckett's martyrdom, it went up through the crown of the head. Listening and singing becomes a fully embodied experience. This is akin to a Buddhist meditation practice that he had encountered through his extensive work with Jill Purse. Purse's work has been formative for some of the BPT's ritual praxis. She developed a healing method using voice, which underscores the capacity of song to lead to greater spiritual awareness. She has explored this in various ways and contexts, including a fellowship in the biophysics department at King's College London, where she focused on the relationship between art, science, and spirituality, and by studying chant at Gyatso Monastery in the Himalayas. Part of her praxis engages chant and ceremony to heal the resonant fields of family and ancestors, unlocking persistent patterns so that order and joy is restored. When I was I was tweeting the other day actually about this presentation and Michael Uluadare, who's a Jesuit from the Northwest Africa province, actually shared his perspective on this writing, our ancestors join us when we sing, even though we may not see them. 
The invocation of spirit, as he put it, is something that crosses cultural and temporal boundaries. And there's not time to develop this in this presentation, but I do wanna signal it. The idea of connection to the past through music has been integral to the work of the BPT. The theory of resonance that Hayward used to describe Godric's song above also draws from the work of Rupert Sheldrake, who contends that chant and song contain a, resident, a resonance that extends across time and is activated by ritual. This serves to connect present participants with all those who have done the ritual before right back to the first time it was performed. And I'm quoting Sheldrake there. Godric's song functions as a container of memory on BPT, on BPT pilgrimages as it is sung and repeated in various holy places and spaces. The early 20th century scholar James Rankin rejected the idea that Godric's poem was miraculously inspired, but argued that it still had a protective capacity and apotropaic capacity outside of its religious context. He connected Godric's songs in form and purpose to a charm or incantation type of verse, such as a specific Anglo-Saxon bee charm. To do so though, is to miss the point, I think, of the song as a symbol or as a vessel of memory and as a prayer for the pilgrim to fill and to share the contents of. It's possible to think of songs themselves as carrying these resonant connections as Sheldrake describes. The spiritual experience that Hayward has felt while singing Godric's Marian hymn is certainly in line with the hermit's own description of closeness to divine, divine, especially in the Our Lady Undercroft Chapel, where Hayward so strongly perceived the presence of the Virgin Mary as mother and as protectress. The song seemed to activate the space of the cathedral and awaken Hayward's senses in order to really perceive the presence of Mary. Now, I should say that I had a similar experience on a recent uh, research trip to Canterbury. The rain had come in droves, as it has actually in Berkeley today. I was cold and wet and had found a wooden chair to sit on to dry off in the dark corner of the chapel of the martyrdom, where I was hardly visible. I watched as staggered groups of one to three or four visitors entered the chapel. Most took a sort of cursory look at the site of martyrdom as if it were a mere historical curiosity and then moved on. But then something changed. The organ sounded for choir practice, resounding from the walls and ceiling. It was then that people started to treat the space as a chapel. Suddenly they knelt, they touched, and they looked up at the soaring ceiling where Beckett had fallen. The idea of songs having a home is pivotal to the work of the BPT, and it's worth quoting Hayward at some length. He credits Will Parsons, co-founder of the BPT, for helping him to discover this. Hayward writes, every song is from somewhere, either in terms of where it was composed or where inspiration first reached its creator, and its essence can be transmitted from one person to another, who then can carry it to another place and embed the song there. Whatever song you may sing in its home, which means either its place of origin or alternatively any appropriate place or context. With each performance, the precise moment of time and place and combination of elements like weather, the light of day, where you are standing, what you can see, who you are with, which animals are around, et cetera, increase the value of each performance. It will never be quite the same again. Furthermore, all these factors work together to strengthen your memory of the song by giving it a rich context. In the case of the St. Marie hymn, there are multiple levels of context. Some are cultural and some are spiritual, predicated on belief. The hymn is connected first and foremost to the Virgin Mary and Mary Magdalene, and through the Virgin Mary, it traveled to Godric, and then hundreds of years later, it has been returned to the interior of cathedral spaces associated with Godric in the imagination, like Canterbury, or history, like Finkel. For those who sing and hear it, the hymn becomes connected to a memory of the place. As one BPT pilgrim recounted, 
the sounds, sensations, and impressions continue to resonate and I feel blessed. In this way, the song functions as a sort of aid memoir of the pilgrimage experience in the same way an ampulla of Canterbury water might. And now I would like to turn to the idea of Godric's hymn as a relic and as a souvenir. Generally speaking, souvenirs often found in the form of ampullae of holy water or badges have long, long served as an aid in reenacting the journey in the imagination of pilgrims who have traveled to a specific site. They can also function as an imaginative link, and I quote Yash Elsner there, with a sacred landscape or space for someone who hopes to encounter that place in the future. Particularly popular at medieval Canterbury, for about a century after Beckett's martyrdom, were ampulla made of metal, usually lead, which was thin and pliable enough to be pinched shut. Pilgrims use these to collect Canterbury water, believed to contain a trace of Beckett's blood. Pilgrim badges and ampulla were bought by pilgrims at markets surrounding the shrines and were often worn on hats or clothing. The mass production and sale of these souvenirs in the Middle Ages, as today, had several purposes. The badges served as aids to devotion, to spur mental pilgrimage, and as a souvenir or a hopeful reminder of some future journey. Holy water that was stored inside, as in the case of the Beckett ampulla, could be administered for healing. A whole drop, oh, one drop could also diffuse an entire well with holiness. If there's any students here taking art and pilgrimage this semester, you'll recognize the slide. When sewn into Psalters and prayer books, these souvenirs provided a more complex devotional experience for the reader or viewer who could either recall their own journey or embark on a virtual mental pilgrimage. Megan Foster Campbell writes about the apotropaic or protective capacities of lead and tin pilgrimage badges that were collected as souvenirs from sacred locations, worn by pilgrims to protect them from harm, and later sewn onto the pages of illuminated devotional books. Godric's song can be described as a sort of contact relic of Beckett due to Godric's exchange of messages with the saint. The song is also, of course, connected to the Virgin Mary and Mary Magdalene, who sang to Godric in the first place. In her comprehensive essay on the origin of the fuzzy idea of these contact relics and modern and medieval understandings of their use, Julia Smith has noted that the classification is a mid 20th century variant on the categories prescribed in post Tridentine canon law and highlights a key point, which is the tension between spontaneous and officialized veneration. A connection can be drawn between medieval and modern sensibilities. In the distant past and still today, relics are objects that derive their meaning from the subjective understanding of those who cherish them, says Smith. The Saint Marie hymn was given to Godric as a protective prayer to be invoked in times of need to shield and help and bring to joy with God and hence reflects the use of these other religious pilgrimage objects. Helen Deeming makes a similar point about the song in its original context. The scribe inserted the music directly into the text where Godric's divine experiences are described. Hence, the importance attached to the song being the very words of St. Godric himself. By inserting those words into an utterance of the saint, the scribe restored them to the authority which, with which they were endowed by the vision of the Virgin Mary. And I quote Deeming there. The manuscript version has the immediacy of a pilgrimage souvenir sewn onto a page, but with the additional possibility of being attached to a melody which can be vocalized, hence carrying a trace of the spirit or holiness of Godric's utterance. Music, like the Beckett water collected by pilgrims, is also perceived as having the capacity to heal. Drawing from her own experiences as a musicologist, musicologist, a religious sister, and a longtime nurse and clinician, Ruth Stanley has emphasized that ancient cultures believed that the voice held special mystical powers and seamlessly traveled through temporal and spiritual realms to facilitate healing and that vocalizing served as a bridge between worlds and could be used directly to impact mental 
physical and emotional well being. During British pilgrimage trust pilgrimages, music such as Godric's song, which is connected to multiple holy people and places, the Virgin Mary, Marian Sites, Beckett, Canterbury, Godric, Durham, Finkel, takes participants outside of their comfort zone and into a new shared zone of uncertainty. The anthropologists Victor and Edith Turner use the word communitas to describe the feeling of spontaneous encounters with others and the possibility of renewal and transformation that occurs on a pilgrimage. In order for communitas to be enacted, the pilgrim has to step away from the day-to-day -day into a zone of liminality. However, pilgrims always bring their own experiences to the table. And rather than making claims about the homogeneity of the pilgrim group, it's compelling for me and my research to think about communitas across time. By that, I mean the sense of connection that pilgrims feel to those who have encountered the same object or song through the ages. As I've discovered through my research, while pilgrims do enjoy the shared experience of walking and singing in a group, where the real magic happens is when they encounter a landscape, a song, or an object that brings about a sense of connection with God, with their ancestors, and with the saints. We can think of this as communitas as enacted through culture, and it's compatible with Sheldrake's idea of resonance. It is helpful in describing the presence of past and future or with the design or with the divine when a symbol of vehicle is encountered, be it a song as in Godric St. Marie, a structure like the Our Lady of Undercroft Chapel at Canterbury or an enshrined relic. In other words, through singing a sacred text like Godric's hymn, or in making tactile contact with a relic or sacred object, the pilgrim not only forms communitas among the group of people with which they are traveling, but with an entire cloud of witnesses. Another way to think about this is through comparison to the liturgy, where the community is invited to join their voices with a never-ending hymn of praise of the heavenly company. This is when we come closest, I think, to that resounding through time and sacred narrative. It is compatible also with the concept of animesis, derived from the Greek word to remember and used in relation to the liturgy to describe, in my colleague, Father Paul Genoviak's words, the promise of past present. On BPT pilgrimages, pilgrims are encouraged to follow their ritual instincts through song, prayer, touch or really whatever feels comfortable and with the common goal of enacting an extra temporal communitas. It's what Will Parsons calls a communitas also through quest consciousness, striving for common goals and reaching them, especially holy places which actually work. Whatever the diffuse understanding of them, there is a shared actuality of being there in the same place at the same time and feeling what this place does, a shared awe and smallness when stood by a cathedral, a common temporality when one touches a 1000 year old yew tree. These experiences and encounters of place where mysterious higher truth seems closer or something is going on, they bring us together. It is not just the singing, walking or touching, but an activation of the senses that work together to create a fully embodied experience. One BPT pilgrim, the poet, musician, and guardian journalist, Alan Frank's thoughts echo these ideas. He wrote, connection was the aim, the kind made between walking, talking companions, even before Geoffrey Chaucer wrote his Canterbury Tales, but also between the present route and the past through which it went. Song is removed enough from associations with Catholic popular piety to appeal to the imagination of a British public who now profess a variety of religious beliefs or none. Songs connect through word and lyric, but they also connect in physical terms for songs are written down and are passed through breath and vibration. The BPT ensures that pilgrimage remains open to all. Their project appeals to pilgrims of varying abilities by activating not just one, but many of the senses with haptic experience being integral to the experience, including sight and touch, but sound, resonance and vibration. 
Songs are souvenirs, ex votos, and sites in and of themselves. They serve to activate spaces and the senses. And now, without further ado, um, I will now play the new arrangement of Godric's song. The performance is about two minutes. And afterward, I think there might be time for a few questions. So is the music, has the music been working so far? Arthur, I see you. Have you been hearing it, music? It, it's been a little spotty. It's been a little spotty. OK, let me see if I could fix that before I play this. Let's see. The first one did fine. The the one at Canterbury was a little spot. OK, I've optimized it. <laughs> I've optimized Good. it. So let me try. Arthur, I can see you on my screen. So if it's if it's sounding weird, just make a signal and I'll try to fix it again. OK. Okay, so I hopefully can take a few questions if there are any. Yeah. Uh, first, Kate, let me, on behalf of the 108 people that are watching you, uh, thank you so much for the splendid lecture, which um, usually I would have thought, well, we would kind of have to apologize for not being able to do this in person, but I think it actually worked uh, as well or better to be able to have this close up multimedia experience. And uh, you have in your lecture demonstrated exactly what you talked about, which is the carrying of an experience across space and across time. Uh, so thank you very much for that. And I know we're all delighted to uh, have enjoyed it. Um, there are questions appearing in the chat and others, if you have um, have other questions, please put them there and we'll get to as many as we can. We're going to stop in about 15 minutes, so um, but we'll take it until there. We will have our final word for the evening. Thank you so much, Arthur. And I should say thank you very much, Kate, for everything that you've done for us over the years and for all of the um, enrichment that you've given to all of us and all of your students for the entire time you've been here. Um, for myself and I think for everyone, we can deeply, deeply appreciate the um, invitation that you've given us to reappropriate song um, as uh, song and sacred sound as a way for us to be connected to the sacred around us um, and especially in these perilous times. 
Um, for myself and for the library staff, I wanna thank everyone for attending tonight, um, the 28th annual uh, reading of the sacred text, an important thing that we do at GTU. And I look forward next year to where we can do this perhaps in public um, for another, uh, another lovely evening of, of reflection on what makes a text sacred or what, um, what changes us into sacredness around a text or a, or a sacred tradition. Thank you very much again. And I very, very much um, hope that you have a pleasant evening or good morning or good night, wherever it is you are. Thank you.